Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we're addressing the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. Join us each week as we spark a midlife renewal and create a firm foundation for the next wonderful, exciting, awesome season of life. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. It is great to be here with you. I'm Curtis. I'm here with Karen. Good morning, everybody. And we are here with a very special guest, J.P. DeGantz. And I can't wait until you hear what he has to say, what he has to share about the church and marriage and his mission. It's super, super fascinating, you guys. I am floored by some of what JP has been sharing with us. JP is a true expert. He's a true worker in the field. He is out there. He is transforming parishes. He's transforming the church. He is the founder and president of Communio, and that's an organization well, it increases human flourishing by equipping communities and churches to build out proven data-formed, informed strategies that strengthen marriage, families, and faith. So Communio, one of their efforts was a project in Jacksonville, Florida, that because of their efforts, they saw the divorce rate drop by 28% in two years, if you can believe that. Holy cow, that's amazing. Yeah, and JP, he's written about that in his book. He's a co-author of the book Endgame, The Church's Strategic Move to Save Faith and Family in America. And, and here's the byline. I'm going to go ahead and read this, you guys. The family crisis in America has battered society and reduced belief in Jesus Christ. So far, the church has struggled to address it. Oh, isn't that the truth? Threatening the very future of Christianity. And I think JP is going to explain how true that is. And it's up to us to use our best strategies to combat all this. And the book Endgame recognizes, hey, time is running out to solve this crisis of faith and crisis of demographics. And he, he's got the empirical research, the strategy, and, and the work on the ground. So JP DeCants, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, Karen and Curtis. Awesome to be with you both. <laughs> We're really excited about about your mission. So so what's the problem? I people, the young people are we're used to them leaving the church and then coming back when they're married and the church continuing itself, but that's not happening anymore and mass partition, participation rates are falling off and how urgent is this crisis and situation? It's, yeah, it's incredibly urgent. I, you know, and COVID accelerated everything substantially, right? We're working now in some dioceses and archdioceses where mass attendance now, and, and obviously we're recording this in, in 2022, are, are still down 44% from their pre-COVID levels. I mean, there's... Wow. Uh, things are... When you look at the current state of play, right? Somewhere between two and four of all of every Catholic goes to church on Sunday. To put that in perspective, there's, according to CARA, there's somewhere around 73 million Catholics. There's somewhere shy of, you know, somewhere close to 16,500 parishes. If every Catholic went to mass on Sunday, every parish should be averaging close to 4,500 people in attendance at mass on Sunday, right? And, and obviously we're nowhere near that. And, and so, no matter how you look at it, we have a deep need to re-evangelize our own baptized Catholics. So, of course, Matthew 28 was not, Jesus didn't say, bring the gospel to the Catholics, right? He, we also have a need to evangelize all those who have not yet come to believe. And so there's a deep need within all of our communities, around all of our parishes, to equip them to evangelize to those who are not yet Catholic, right? And so that, that that's religious non-affiliation. Is another way you can look at it keeps growing and keeps getting younger, right? Those who hold no faith at all both grows and, and becomes uh, more youthful. So no matter how you look at it, the fields are white for the harvest. So then the question is, how do you, 
how should the workers harvest, right? And I think throughout history, our greatest evangelists have 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 reaped the harvest through felt need, right? You begin to identify what is the big need in the area, right? We know this already, right? Catholics are amazing evangelists in Africa, as a, for instance, right? And and when we do evangelization well, we don't walk off an airplane and start quoting the catechism, right? In 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 sub-Saharan Africa, we walk off a plane and we fight, figure out what are the needs in the community. What are, we see that there's not a, there's a lack of water, there's a lack of uh, food, and, and we then come alongside in communities and accompany those communities to to fill those needs. Yeah, JP. So in our suburban parish, I mean, we're looking around and we're saying. This is a wonderful, thriving parish, and it's been built by those who came before us, and we are entrusted with that treasure. And looking at the trends in the demographics and looking at how the young people are not coming back to Mass after you know leaving as at a younger age, our, our parish is going to be greatly reduced in 20, 30 years. It's Maybe it's not even going to be there. It's going to get consolidated or something. The, the demographic piece of this or the crisis in faith is, well, I think crisis is a good word for it. Right. And, and a big thing, because Communia works with Catholic parishes, we also work with, we have an ecumenical staff, and we also have folks who work with Protestant churches. One of the things I like to point out, is while Catholics, we make up 23% of the US population, okay? We only make up 4% of the houses of worship. And what that means is that your average Catholic parish is probably about six times the size of your average Protestant church, okay? And so what that can, we can sit in our pews sometimes and see, well, there's a lot of people at mass on Sunday. And we can think there's some health when that size can hide a morbidity and hide that demographic cliff that you're talking about, right? And the reality is, is what we found in in our work, in our in our work in Jacksonville and afterwards, we partnered with a guy named Mark Regnerus, who's a scholar at the University of Texas, and we co-sponsored his surveys in 2014 and 2018. And we found this amazing statistic that just hit us, which was the difference between a millennial going to church every week and a baby boomer going to church every week pretty much vanished if I knew one thing about both people, and that is if they had the same family structure. If they grew up in a home of continuously married parents. There was no significant difference between how often a baby boomer and how often a millennial goes to church. Well, that that's shocking. Let me let me just jump in there. So, so I I know that the younger generations aren't going back to mass at the same rate as their parents. But, but what you're telling us is, hey, hey, Curtis, look, if, if both parents are married, then the kids are going to mass at the same percentage rate, regardless of whether or not they're boomers or Xers or whatever. Yeah, the biggest gift we, yeah, St. Saint, Saint Bosco used to say the biggest gift you can give your kid is holiness, and I would add to it. The witness, which is related to this, obviously, is is the gift of a of a joyful and holy marriage, right? And what you see is uh, this is it's not the only factor that determines whether or not people go to church, but it's uh, what we would call an exogenous factor, right? It's not something that your child can control, right? Uh, nobody goes to church because goes to church first and then chooses the family they come from. Okay, the family they come from precedes in time and place everything else in their life, okay? And just coming from a home where mom and dad stay married doubles the likelihood. That one factor doubles the likelihood of a child going to church every week for the rest of their life. Now, are there other things that you need to do and should do to, to foster faith in Jesus and a practice of their Catholic faith? Yes, there are. There are other things that you should do and need to do. But just to show how powerful th that one factor is, that one exogenous variable doubles the likelihood of a millennial going to church every week throughout their life. So, JP, I'm wondering if you could clarify and explain to me 
specifically, what is your mission? Yeah. And how is it that you step into this gap or this place yeah. to create transformation? Yeah, we okay. We think sure. some prologue before the, the mission, a couple assumptions that, that will f fuel the, the mission. We think the church has the answers, okay, because she's the body of Christ, okay? And and so we want to take a John the Baptist approach, which is we want to decrease and we want the church to increase, okay? So with that said, our mission is to equip churches to become evangelizing hubs that promote healthy relationships and marriages. We believe the lack of healthy relationships that lead to marriage and healthy mar the collapse of healthy marriages themselves is at root and branch of the collapse of faith in the West. Our mission is to equip churches to become evangelizing hubs. So how we do that is we call our three uniques that we add to a church, which is our tools, our strategies, and our resources. So we believe there's no gospel mandate to be unsophisticated. So we provide advanced tools of data to diagnose what's going on in a church and a community, ad advanced marketing resources to equip the church to, to do pre-evangelization, to reach out and draw people in, strategies, meaning we've studied and understand evidence-based approaches that have been proven academically to produce healthy, vibrant, and Christ-centered marriages. We've studied the areas of pre-evangelization and evangelization that, that in order to inform the development of, of relationship and marriage ministry, and we provide those strategies, and we consult and support churches on the way to do it. And that third piece is resources, okay? We're a nonprofit ministry, and so we provide, our, our donors are sold out on the idea that the church is the solution, okay? We wanna come alongside churches to equip them to win this battle for the family. What Sister Lucia said was in 1983, she said was this, the final battle would be over marriage and the family. We want to equip the church to win that battle. So what do you find, JP, to be your primary challenges in making that happen? Okay, gosh, a few. Sure, I'm <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> right? I, I'm going to speak to how when we work in, in, in Catholic settings, okay? Okay. Our, our parishes, I'm going to... I'm not going to pull any punches here. Okay. Our parishes have largely become sacramental service stations. Okay. You, you, most Catholics interact with their parish in the sense that they show up and, and tank up with their supernatural rocket fuel on Sunday, if they show up at all. And, and they, they interact with in parish life, almost none. Okay. In between that, they might, you know, some number of them get to confession, some number of them get to mass. They know very few people are, uh, so, so there is largely a lack of an evangelizing heart in many of our, most, I will say, the vast majority of our parishes lack an evangelizing heart, okay? Okay, so so that's a major obstacle, okay? The other obstacle is a cognitive disconnect amongst our church's, church's leadership. And, I've, I, and I'm gonna repeat what a, someone in a, in a position of leadership in a diocese, a very faithful diocese said to me. She said, our priests already get this, and by that she means the centrality of marriage is super important. It's absolutely, mission critical. She said, so there's nothing else we can do. They already get this. Okay. And in a certain sense, that's cognitively true. Okay. All our priests and bishops know that marriage and the family is the foundation from which everything is built. Okay. 82%. That said, this is the cognitive disconnect. Yeah. Okay. 82% sure. of our Catholic parishes report spending $0 each year on marriage and relationship ministry. So if you think about it, okay, on one side, almost all priests and bishops would say, it's the most important thing, okay? It's the most important building block, right? Pope St. John Paul II said, uh, parents are the first heralds of the gospel, right? This is really important. On the flip side, we put our money behind what we value, okay? And if we measure what marriage by what we, the money we put into it, then it, what it means is we don't value it, okay? We don't value it. If anything, we, we, you know, if, if you get a sacramental marriage, you have to canonically have some area, some level of formation. So we'll, we'll prep you in some way for marriage and we'll probably not, not do a great job of it. But then after that, there's no rule of life. There's no expectation. You're on your own until uh, either your funeral or, or some, some major problem happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, so JP, we can have this idea, right? That Hey, my marriage is decent, you know, no decent is good. Or we can have the idea that, well, th things aren't going that great. We'll work it out. I, I, I mean, it's, it's like, what, 
what can the church do for my marriage anyway? Like, really? That's yeah, that's and and I want to and I want to emphasize it's that's the huge problem. And then because Karen, you asked a good question on optional. The other is people just aren't getting married. Okay. And and our parishes and our church, in many ways, we're acting like it's 1955 and people just keep showing up to get married. And and there's 61 percent fewer people getting married, fewer marriages today than in the year 1970. Within the Catholic Church, it's, it's actually worse than that, right? Okay, to, to give you some scope, we all know there's a vocation crisis to the priesthood. For sure. We all are praying for more priests, okay? There are 38% fewer priestly ordinations in the most recent year that Kara kept the data versus 1970, okay? The number of Catholic weddings are down 76.8% over the same period. So to put it in perspective, the cliff in Catholic weddings is twice as steep as the cliff in priestly vocations. Wow. So the marriage vocation crisis is twice as bad as the priestly vocation crisis? Right. Dang. And in a sense, the, one of the points I like to make is, in a certain sense, we're crushing it with priestly vocations. You could make the case, right? Right. What it means is it's we're getting comparative. twice as many priests from the number of Catholic weddings that currently exist. We're getting a lot more juice than we should out of the fruit that we have. Oh, JP, this is not the news. This is not the happy news I wanted from you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. But this is, I, you know, sometimes I, I think the first step is I, I got I to gotta be Jeremiah first before I can be John, channel my namesake, John Paul, because we got we to gotta be very serious about where we are. Because if we're not serious about where we are, we're not going to be willing to do anything different. We will continue to do what we've done year in and year out, and we will close more churches. We'll close more parishes. We're working in a diocese that's dropped from, we're working now with two parishes in a diocese that's dropped from 200 parishes and they're dropping to 55. Wow. Okay. This is, this is, if, if we don't do something different, nothing will change. And that includes how we raise our children, how we talk to them about marriage, how we create a culture of vocation and culture of, of fostering marital vocations in our homes as, as Catholic parents. So what do you think the answer is? Okay, so so we we believe the answer is at the parish level. People, at the end of the day, it's not the diocesan church. People don't, no one ever says, hey, I belong to the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I belong to the Archdiocese of San Francisco. To the extent subsidiarity is the idea that the, the unit closest to the problem needs to solve it. So we think that that unit closest to the problem that can solve it is the parish. Okay, we need to, we need to equip the parish to be the change agent and foster a subculture of of, of Christ-centered marriages, okay? That and that it needs to be an evangelizing ministry to do that. So we talk about we equip parishes with. I'm going to use a, a term from from say philosophy. We present parishes with the form, and then we work with Father and his leadership team to construct what the matter would look like in a parish. And the form is what we call the data informed full circle relationship ministry. And that's a mouthful. Quickly unpacking, it means data to diagnose and analyze what's going on so that we can have a full realization of what's going on and how and what are the felt needs. Okay. And then by full circle relationship ministry, we cannot see marriage ministry as the ministry only for people who are currently married because so few people are getting married. Right. So it needs to be full circle, which means serving and supporting and ministering to those in single life. And it, that means all of the messiness of single life, okay, of which it's is substantial so that we can, and so we work with a parish to select best practices in ministry around each stage there, okay? And then the big challenge is very few people, I was sharing with, with, with you, Karen, in our conversation earlier that, that very few people work on relationship skills and marriage skills. A very small number of people do that. Okay. One of the biggest barriers to this is the idea and the stigma associated with practicing the skills of having a good relationships and marriages. Okay. And that's what we need to obliterate. And that's what we work with the parish to obliterate. Okay. We got to get people running to relationship and marriage ministry rather than running from it. It has to be fun. It has to be attractive for men 
okay? Two-thirds of the married people going to church on Sunday are, are women, not men. And three-fourths of the single people are women, not men. So we've got to get the men to show up, okay? If we don't solve that problem, we're toast, okay? And then the resources need to be relevant, okay? And relevant for this for this century, and it can't look like an after-school special from the 1990s, okay? So, so we work with parishes on all of those different on all of those different pieces. And, and the way it's animated is our ministry engagement ladder. It's our four-step approach to do a pre-evangelization that draws out folks inside of the parish and those outside of the parish, right? Because I said earlier that our parishes are functionally sacramental service stations. So we've got to evangelize to our parish and we have to do pre-evangelization within the parish community, within the community, right? The parish boundary, right? And draw people in because our pastors Canon 528 makes them morally responsible for the souls in their parish boundary, whether they like it or not. And that's, that's how we want to, we want to equip pastors who understand that that's their moral obligation. So that's, we think that's really the solution so that parish, it becomes normative, uh, right? Parish, it right. becomes normative in parishes to focus on having great, great healthy relationships that for those called to the married life that then they can enter married life and live it well in a Christ-centered way. So really, you are trying to shift a whole set of mindsets here. The mindset of the parish in terms of their role and what they're about, and the mindset of the Catholic in the pew who thinks, I only do this if there's a problem, versus this is a consistent part of how I live my faith, is continuously working on and improving my relationships in marriage. Yeah. You know, all the married people listening to this, they should know. If they, many of them already know this, Holy Mother Church knows this is badly needed within the priestly life, right? Canonically, every priest is required to do a spiritual retreat each year. Okay. If your priest comes back from a spiritual retreat, do you ever say to him, wow, were you struggling? Is that why you did that retreat? No, no. But, but if you're at mass on Sunday, after mass, you're having a, you're, you're having a donut. Someone walked up to you and said, oh, my wife and I went on a marriage retreat last weekend. What's your first assumption, right? In every p parish and church I go into, almost everybody raises their hand and says, oh, I assume that they must be struggling. Well, then, then your parish is failing the task of creating a culture where everybody invests in the growth, growth in their vocation. And this is one of the big challenges because most parishes have a women's group and they have a men's group. But I'm going to tell you, I don't have a vocation to be a man. I have a vocation to be a married man, and I need to grow in my vocation. I only grow it in my discipleship to Jesus if I'm growing in my vocation as a married man, because that is the vocation God has chosen for me, right? And so we need to create an expectation in our parishes where that 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 becomes normative. So how did you get involved in this and zero in on this as your as your thing, JP? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really long way from my degree field. I was a <laughs> journalism. So I, was, I thought I was going to be a sports Oh, really? Writer. <laughs> and uh, graduating from the University of Florida. And uh, I ended up getting in, into politics largely because of my family's faithfulness and encouragement around the life issue. Came to D.C. and uh, started to work in the, in the public policy and political world and did that in different ways from 2002 to 2013. And God exposed me to some amazing life experiences, building out lots of neat things and working with predictive analytics. And one of the things that the political life has within it that is useful to know is that it's a binary outcome, right? There's, you know, and there's a, there's a timeline, right? November is always coming and you know whether or not you win or lose. It causes you to husband resources and work strategically to achieve an outcome. Okay. And there's a lot that I learned from that. Okay. So, but 14 years ago, God started redirecting my steps. My sister's family failed. She was in an abusive marriage. We had three kids of our own at the time. And she asked us to take in her four kids, 10, 11, and 14, and 15. Oh, we wow. really got wow. to know firsthand what happens when families fail. And we had some good friends in our parish who had all the right externals, NFP practicing families, five or six kids, children going to Christendom College, Newman Guide Schools. And, Things looked, you know, great. And they, they just, marriages ended in divorce within, there were three of these divorces that happened over about 24 months after my sister's kids moved in with us. And those are just, you know, two by fours to the head kind of moments 
because it just blew apart your basic assumptions about, you know, if you pray the rosary and practice NFP, like, you know, things should be great, right? And uh, recognizing that that grace builds on nature and there's a lot going on in our culture that's destroying our nature that is making it harder for that grace to take hold, right? So I got a call in 2013. He was going to go to a place called the Philanthropy Roundtable, was looking for a chief operating officer. I told the president of that organization I had a deep interest in figuring out ways to work with philanthropists to find ways to save faith and family. I didn't know what it would look like, but I knew it would leverage a lot of what I had used in the, in the business and political world and to baptize it, sanctify it, and see what can be applied in the realm of ministry. And that created a, a our experiment where we raised and spent about $20 million in four years. And we found a lot of things that didn't work at all and made a lot of mistakes. And, and But thanks be to God, we found some things that did work. And Jacksonville, you noted it, where where we lowered the divorce rate substantially countywide and over a three-year period. And we we had independent researchers validate those findings and conclude there was no explanation for that decline other than our intervention in the county. And then churches that we worked with also grew. They, they saw their attendance grow. When churches aren't just sacramental service stations, but when you feed people in felt need, Sunday attendance grows, right? And so that's what we saw. And so then we we decided to spin off and stop being a project of the Philanthropy Roundtable. And we rebranded as Communio in December 2018, February 20, 2019. And we, we were off to the races. And, and now we're, we see our, our, our customer, if you will, as the parish and the church. I always tell people, no one will ever go to a Communio marriage program. Okay. We need, we think, no, one, nobody's heard of us, right? And so at what point do you go to an organization you've never heard of to get help you don't know you need? We, okay, so we don't want to solve that problem. People will go to go to churches, and so we want to equip them. We think they're the change agent. And so we think of ourselves as a B2B, and that, that's short of hand for those who don't know what means business to business. We we want to equip the church to be the to be the change agent. So what's the kind of transformation you see? I know you've mentioned some, some research or some numbers that you've done, but when you go into a parish and you put together a program with them, what's the kind of transformation you see in that parish? Yeah, I'll give you some examples, right? So, so when we get started, we talk about our process as four steps, analyze, plan, implement, and review, okay? Analyze, you start with gathering data on what's going on in the parish, okay? There's both gathering historical data, and then we run a first-party survey, meaning we deploy a mobile survey in mass on Sunday. Depends the, par the your pastor's view of the germ, the general instruction on the Roman Missal, and how they their comfort level. It might be during announcements or it might be during the homily, but we get a snapshot, 60 to 90 seconds of how everybody in the pews is doing, okay? What we're finding is that of your married people, 22% of your married people self-report struggling right now in their marriage, meaning they're trending towards a divorce. And women are between 35 and 40% more likely to report struggling in their marriage than their husbands, okay? That's mass goers. These are people in mass, right? And that's from mass goers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me emphasize, I mean, sorry. I, I mean, I read the book. This is everywhere. This is everywhere you go. You, you see that percentage, and like Karen says, that's mass goers. It is, it's it's us. It is the faithful, rosary clutching, praying mass goers that have that high rate. Yeah, I'll tell you, we have, we were working in an affluent. We are now working with an in a very affluent parish in Kansas City, as an example, and. They see, they have all the externals. They look like they're thriving. Okay. In that parish, I, I believe it was um, the women were 60% more likely to say that they were struggling and 22% of all the marrieds said they were struggling. Right. And if one person in the marriage is struggling, guess what? The marriage is struggling. So that means you're, you're much, you're, you're talking about, you know, three you know, in that one parish closing in on 35%, 30, 3% of all the marriages are struggling, okay? That's an immediate need. The other that we see is singles, 40%, between 40 and 45% of those who are unmarried 
self-report being lonely or isolated, okay? That we use the UCLA Loneliness Index, which is an academic measure. Okay, everything that we use is grounded in research, okay? So I'm not just some sports writer <laughs> <laughs> just shooting from the hip here. Okay, we're grabbing on to some really high quality data, data-informed, research-driven responses. And so what we know about that is if you come up, if you are lonely or isolated, the research says that you are, your lifespan is likely to be 15 years shorter than someone who's not. Okay. So there's great need for those who are unmarried as well. And we want to equip a, a parish to serve both communities really well. Okay. And so then what we're seeing, I'll, I'll tell you, as a result of, of raising the banner for healthy relationships and evangelizing into the community, one parish that we're working with in Florida, had only seen six, they had the prior year had six convalidations in the lat in the prior year. Okay. Full year, 12 months. In the first quarter of the of the, the year they started working with us, they had 13 convalidations scheduled and in the queue uh, in, in just three months. Okay. One of the things that, that started to surface is there are people in the in the pair showing up and says in irregular situations. Okay. And just even the encouragement that the parish is a is a place where where healthy relationships and marriages are norm, normative and people actually run to the ministry where they're having they're having fun date nights okay they're having great you know their valentine's date nights they're having they did a they're doing a big hoedown coming up they're doing movie nights they're just doing things where couples have fun together as a for instance and in the process we work with them to these aren't just fun activities Okay, people come for the fun communio, which you know, literally means community. Okay, and then we w work with a church to sprinkle in the right doses of the human formation, right? The skills that you would practice to have a great marriage or great friendships, right? Communication skills, conflict resolution, setting shared expectations, relationship management skills. Some elements dripped into all of those so that the parish just becomes known for this. And so what the church is seeing is, is, People start raising their hand and saying, Hey, father, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a regular situation. I, I think hearing you talk about this, I, I, I want to get, I want to, I want my marriage to be right with the church. That's one, one particular, what one, one very particular fruit. We're seeing uh, an increase in sacramental marriages. We had a church we worked with in, in the Archdiocese of Denver. I set a goal of, of going from four to 16 weddings in a year. Okay, in a year they they went from four to nineteen weddings, sacramental weddings. Okay, they just became a place where the unmarried and the young young adults came and had fun together, and where the vocation of marriage was championed. Okay, in in the parish, and so so we're seeing that. Okay, we're seeing an increase in Sunday Sunday attendance. Okay, we have we're working with parishes now that are that uh, this is not normative across the board, but we're, we are working with parishes that by focusing in this way, they're exceeding 2019 mass attendance levels. And the fact is, this is that more frequently the faith is caught than taught. Okay. So we need our, we need couples and singles to enter into transformative life, Christ-centered relationships in a parish around other faithful Catholics that are practicing the faith and that they can catch the faith and that through that parish, they can also be taught the truths of the faith. Okay. But the truths of the faith are taught within, within relationships of trust and where they're being fed in their, in their, in their felt needs. JP, it's just so inspiring and it's a little chilling to think that we're running out of marriages and we're going to run out of Catholics. And, but it's exciting to know that. This outreach on marriage is working for Catholics. It's working as an evangelism tool. It's bringing more people back to church and into the church. And so many things are happening for our listeners. Of course, you're, you're a co-author of the book End Game, which spells out much of this and much more. It's fascinating, informative, and inspiring book, End Game. End Game, and it's the church's strategic move to save faith and family in America. Uh, yeah, your listeners could pick it up at on Amazon, but uh, endgamebook.org, if you want to save a few bucks, you can get a little cheaper there, endgamebook.org. 
or, or you can certainly find it on Amazon. Perfect. So for our listeners that are excited about Communio's mission, I mean, what, what should they do? Yeah. Look, if you're listening to this podcast, you would, what, you would fall into a group that we call the Christian grass tops. Okay. You're, you're, you're probably a, a practicing Catholic and, and ultimately we need pastors to be contacting us to ask to work with us. So I would, one of the things that you could, you, you, we're seeing really effective is the listener, buy the book, read the book. And then as a result of reading the book, give it to your pastor or ask your pastor to read it. Okay. We've got a, a great video up on Edify. The folks from Catholic Vote did with us uh, that you can find on the Edify channel. You might just send that four minute and 50 second video on Edify's YouTube channel to your pastor and say, we got to, we got to work with Communio. Bring, bring this to our parish. Okay. And be a squeaky wheel. Okay. Where, where frequently that's where we get our new partnerships. Father contacts us or someone from the parish contacts us and says, you know, uh, we keep hearing about this. We'd like to, we'd like to learn more. And then we just have some introductory conversations with Father and we begin exploring whether or not the parish is, is someone that we can, we can work with and support. Well, JP, I'm just, I'm just thrilled in this ministry that you and your many colleagues are engaged on. I, I thank you for that. Thank you for your service and devotion to the church. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Curtis, for having me. And thank you as well for, for your fidelity and, and, and service of the, of the Bride of Christ. Our pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. It's great to be here with you. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite app or platform leave a review that's so helpful so that others like you can find the podcast and be sure to tell your friends. We'll see you next week.